So today we are uh, once again in Genesis 2, verses 18 to 25. Uh, you may have noticed this is our third Sunday in this text, but there's just a lot of good that God has for us. Uh, this will be the second half of the sermon that I began last week. Uh, on the note of marriage, which is what we're going to, uh, the topic we're going to be on again today, uh, let, let me just share this. Um, for a number of years, Don and I actually uh, taught and led a, a pre-marriage course at Westside Church. Uh, Westside had a lot of young people, a lot of young adults, and a lot of uh, relationships and marriages. Three times a year, there was like eight couples that would come and we'd go through, uh, I'd teach this class, and then we'd have mentors. It was a great ministry. But what I noticed, what I started saying over the years as I did it, uh, to those who were not yet married, as I would say, look, I'm, I'm going to try to convince you of two things uh, in this course. Uh, number one, that uh, marriage is the greatest gift, uh, next to Jesus, the greatest gift uh, that God will give you. If indeed he calls you to marriage, it is an incredible blessing. It's beautiful, it's satisfying, it's fantastic. And on the other side, I'm going to say to you, this is going to be the hardest thing that you've ever done. It has had the potential for, for real hurt and challenge and frustration, and both of these things are true. If you've been married, you, you probably know this to be true. Uh, and it makes sense that it's true, uh, because while marriage is a beautiful gift from God, this side of the fall, it's also a gift that is difficult to fully enjoy. And because it's such an incredible blessing to have two individuals that God brings together and are united in a deepest sense of who they are, that's the blessing of marriage. And, and, and the challenge, though, is that, well, when it's good, it's fantastic, because the connection is so deep. But when it's bad can be very tough, again, because the connection is so deep. Uh, you don't tend to get hurt very deeply by people you don't really know, but we do hurt the people we know very deeply at times, and so marriage is both of these things, and um, I feel like last week, uh, in, in light of what the Spirit was leading me to do, we, we landed more on the second one, the, the challenge of marriage the difficulty of marriage, and I think it was good and right that we did that. I feel like it was a, a word from the Lord that, that many marriages needed and that he would use, and I hope that's the case. Uh, but as I've been thinking and praying about uh, this message, kind of the second half, uh, I feel myself leaning more towards the, the first, uh, the beauty of marriage, the wonder of marriage. And it's not that I've changed my points, it's just that as I sort of thought and prayed about what these points mean, I think this is really what they are saying what they mean for us to, to grasp today, that this design from God is for our good and it's a beautiful design. So let me read the text once again and then let's get to our, our truths for this morning about marriage. Here's verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and brought her to the man, and the, then the man said, <clears throat> This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So our one uh, point, the one main claim that this text I think is teaching us about marriage is this. Uh, God designed marriage for our good. Last week, we saw two characteristics of this good design. One, that it was between one man and one woman. Secondly, that it was for life. And now the third thing that I think we should focus on is that there are different roles that God has intended for the man and the woman in marriage. Now, uh, a big part, I think, of the beauty of God's design in general is the fact that he created the living world with a binary sexuality. Uh, I know there are some organisms that reproduce asexually, like starfish and uh, little weird bug things that I looked up, but frankly, they're not as beautiful as, that's not true, they're beautiful in their own way, 
But uh, most of the time, the majority of the organism, the creatures that God has made, are male and female, and they come together to produce offspring, and this is a beautiful thing. Uh, we see this uh, difference not just in the, the biology of the animal kingdom, for instance, but also in the, the behavior. We know that uh, male peacocks behave differently than female peacocks. And if you want to see something crazy, look at the male birds of paradise. They have all these weird rituals they do to try to uh, attract the attention of the, of the female. There's differences that God made, and it, it contributes to the beauty of God's world. And I would say we see the same sort of pattern in humanity. Not, not that we're just another animal, we, we've covered that, but rather that this pattern of complementary differences is seen to an even greater depth and even greater beauty in the way God created humanity, in that he created the male and female, but also gave them roles to be lived out in this marriage relationship. So just to state it clearly from the front end, what we find in Genesis and throughout the Bible in marriage is that the man is called to the role of leadership, and that the woman is called to the role of helper, and that these roles are beautiful and well-intentioned and for our good. Now, I know that uh, this is contrary, almost directly contrary to what our culture would say is good for people and for marriage. Uh, our culture is seeking to flatten out the differences in gender and certainly in, in roles, uh, but our goal as a church uh, should not be to seek man's wisdom when it comes to the way that we live our life. Our goal should be to seek God's wisdom, to seek what it is that God has said about all, you know, everything in our life, and in particular about marriage itself. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to look here in Genesis, the very beginning of marriage, to see God's design for these roles. So I want to first look and see them, so we can see it actually is God's design and then see how they are meant for our good. So why do I say that there are different roles that God intended? Well, uh, there's a few different differences we see here in the text. The first difference I think we see is the, just the different ways that uh, the man and the woman were made. So Adam, of course, was made from the dust, uh, formed dust. God breathed life into him. But with Eve, it was very different. Uh, let's look at verse 21 and 22 again. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now, I don't think this is uh, metaphorical. This is literary what happened. Uh, he fell asleep, took the rib, and made the woman. And so, uh, why did God do this? We should be approaching this whole Genesis thing with the idea that God is doing things for a reason. He doesn't just throwing things at the wall, seeing if they're going to stick, right? Doing crazy things. He's, he means for us to know something about our origin as humanity. And the one thing we know right away is that for men and women, we must be of equal value, equal worth, equal dignity, because we are made of the same stuff. That, that the same substance uh, is in the man and in the woman. But God intentionally didn't make us the same because he intends to show there is still a difference. Not a difference in value, not a difference in equality, but a difference in terms of who we are to be. And so we see this further in the different jobs that God has given us. Uh, in Genesis 2.15, uh, we see that God gave Adam a particular job to do. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. We have a sense of the, the leadership that is needed there, the responsibility that is needed there. Whereas for the woman... She specifically was made to be a helper for Adam. We see this in 2.18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. It's important that we understand this term. Uh, it is in no way a denigrating term. It's not like the help or something lower like we might use it today. Uh, it is uh, a, a role of great esteem. In fact, God himself uh, takes on the role of helper when it comes to us. So Psalm 54, 4, the psalmist says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. And so it would be impossible, I think, for us to see this term helper as somehow lower if God himself is stepping into it. It is simply a different role. And the reason for the difference is that there is a particular task that God has for us to do. If you think about the mandate that God gives to the man and the woman when they are finished, if you remember from Genesis 1, what, were, what was the whole point? What, what was their job? Be fruitful, multiply, 
fill the earth as image bearers of me, have dominion over the earth. Uh, The whole point is that the glory of God would shine through humanity. And so this job was such that what was needed was not just a man, but a man and a woman. And that together, they would be able to fulfill this, this glorious mandate of God. Uh, clearly, uh, the physical need is there that Adam on his own couldn't create many, many other children, but also in the image bearing itself. It was insufficient simply to have a male human being. What God intended was that there would be a male and female together they would be able to bear the image of God fully, glorify his name, and that they could only do it together in in the different ways that God made them, in the different roles that he has given them. The last main way that we see, I think, this this difference and intended roles is in the different levels of responsibility. That you see in what happens in the garden that God is giving a particular responsibility of leadership to Adam. So we see it first in the fact that Adam names the animals, That's always associated with a sense of authority, right? You're naming your children. Uh, God renames people to show his authority. Uh, Adam names the animals. Adam names Eve. Also, uh, God gives Adam the instructions when it comes to the tree. Uh, Also, this is usually a sign of responsibility and certain authority that if, if, you know, in in an organization, uh, the superiors give to a manager, here's the instructions to disseminate to your people, that's a sign of that you are in a position of, of responsibility and leadership. But the main, I think the biggest uh, key sort of telling feature that Adam has a certain level of leadership and responsibility is um, how God responds to them when things go bad. You can usually tell who's in charge by who's the one who bears the brunt of when things go very bad, and that was the case with Adam and Eve. Uh, They both had the word from God, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve is the one who first ate from the tree. You would think that when God came to talk to them, you would go talk to Eve and say, hey, what what did you do? You were the first one, but that's not what happens. Uh, Genesis 3, 8 and 9 tells us clearly. uh, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Clearly, when something goes wrong in this family, in humanity, he goes to Adam because Adam was the head. He was the one who was responsible. He was the one who had been called to protect and to care and to to keep things, and he hadn't done that. And so even though Eve was the first one, in a sense, uh, to sin, but Adam is the one who's responsible, uh, that shows you who was to be the head. So equality with different roles is very clearly seen in Genesis, and it's affirmed throughout the Bible and explicitly affirmed in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, uh, God, through Paul, uh, gives some teaching on marriage that makes it very clear what should a Christian marriage look like. So here's uh, two little excerpts, Ephesians 5.22. This is uh, specifically to the wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And then for men, uh, for the husbands, the next couple verses, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And so we get here greater information, greater insight into the purpose of this and the beauty of this. That as husbands and wives, we are called to to interact with each other in a way that both glorifies God fully and satisfies and cares for us in the deepest parts of who we are as men and as women. The whole point of this is that it is meant to be a blessing in marriage. It is not meant to be restrictive. It is not meant to be oppressive. Uh, It is to be a joy for the wives to feel well-loved by their husband. And it's a joy for husbands to feel well-respected by their wives. This is as God intended it. And it is meant to reflect the very nature of God. If you're wondering whether it's possible to be in a relationship with different levels of responsibility and yet still have equality, we need only look to God himself. For there is Father, Son, and Spirit, equal in glory, equal in power, and yet they step into different roles. The Father has a plan, and the Son says, I will I submit myself to your will gladly, joyfully, and the, the Spirit goes where the Son sends him. This is the beautiful picture of the Trinity. And in marriage, we have an opportunity to reflect that. And more than that, 
we have an opportunity to reflect Christ himself in particular ways. Uh, there's a, a really great book on this issue by Kathy Keller. Uh, we have it out, I think we have some available still, called Jesus, uh, Justice, and Gender Roles. And uh, she has a, I'm going to give you a couple of quotes, but here's the first one that I think does a good job of bringing out this beauty and the glory of this. She writes this, The glory of gender roles for me is that everyone gets to reveal an aspect of Jesus' life. Jesus, in his servant authority, dying in order to bring his bride to spotless purity, has redefined authority and has demanded that all his followers do the same. That was to the husbands. Jesus, in his submissive servanthood, taking the role of a servant in order to secure our salvation, shows that his submission to the Father was a gift, not something compelled from him. At no time is his equality with the Father ever called into question. And I think we'd have to say that is a beautiful thing, that in our marriage we're able to reflect the nature of Christ in a full sense, that in our, in our leadership, in our submission, we are telling everyone around us, look, here's our Savior. Here's who he is. Here's what he's done. And notice what she's saying, that this is a different kind of leadership than the world has. If we think to ourselves uh, authority like the world, we, we're totally misunderstanding the kind of authority, the kind of headship that is intended in marriage. That very explicitly in Ephesians, uh, God says, hey, husbands, if you want to know what it means to lead, look to Christ, the one who sacrificed himself, the one who laid down his life, the one who gave everything for the sake of his bride, the church. And ladies, uh, wives, if you're looking to know how you should submit, submit in glad uh, obedience to what God has called you to. Trusting that his ways are best. Looking to build up your husband in this way. Now, whether we agree that uh, this is a beautiful picture or not, I think we would all agree that this is something that is actually difficult to live out in a way that actually is satisfying and, and cohesive and beautiful. I've spoken to many couples over the, the years that have said, you know, I, I see this in Scripture. Like, I know it's there, and as a Christian, I want to live my life that way, but, but the doing of it is the part that's really hard because, you know, as a wife, I really want my husband to step up and to lead, but he just he doesn't do it. And I've been telling him for years that he needs to do it, and he, and he doesn't, and so I, I just do it because things need to get done. And that's just, you know, Matt's just the, the way it is. I don't know how it's ever going to change. And there's husbands that say, you know, I'd like to do it, but whenever I try to do it, I mess something up, and she tells me I mess something up, and so then I don't do it, and then I shrink back like a, a weakling or a coward because I feel that way, and it's, it just, there's hurt, there's challenge, there's difficulty. You add on to that perhaps the reality that maybe some of us grew up in homes where we never saw this, played out, so we don't even really know what this looks like. You add to that the word from the world that says, look, all of this is, is not right. It's not just. And it makes it very, very difficult. It means that we are trying to understand our role as a sinful human being, patting ourselves after Christ, the perfect human being, and then interacting with someone else who's a sinful human being. And it means that it's a mess a lot of the time. I want to read to, us, read to you again from Kathy Keller, because I think she has a good word on this note. She says, In a sinful world, there will be sinful men and women who oppress and even despise one another for their gender. But in the home, in the church, we have access to both repentance and forgiveness, crucial tools if sinful men and women are to resume their glorious mantles of difference and live together as God's people, fallen, redeemed, forgiven, and forgiving. And really what she's saying there is that if we have any hope of actually understanding who we are as men and women, husbands and wives, and to interact in the way that God intended, we need the gospel of Jesus. We need an abundant grace for each other. We need the power of the Spirit that we might overcome our fears and our hurts and that we might have eyes to see the beauty of what God might be trying to do in, in, our, in our home. And so I would appeal to you, those of you who are married, those of you who, who know that this is a struggle, would you cast your mind and your heart upon the word of God and ask for the spirit of God 
to bring a, a clarity, bring a vision of what your marriage might look like if you embraced these roles. Like wives, what might God do in your marriage if you sought to affirm and encourage your husband in his leadership? I hope you see here that the, the desire of God is not that you would be a doormat, not that you would keep your mouth shut. The desire of God is that you would be a strong partner. And, and one of the chief roles that you have is that of encouraging your husband to step out into those areas of fear that he has, to, to step up and to lead the family, to actually together create a vision, a spiritual vision for your family of who Christ is and where you might go, and that you would encourage him in that way to actually step into the role that God has for him. How might that change in, in your relationship, in your own spiritual walk with the Lord? And husbands, how might it change if you sought to step into that role in the way that God has called you to? Not with a heavy hand, not with a dominating spirit, but with a spirit filled with grace, filled with self-sacrifice, filled with a desire to pour yourself out for your family that they might see day in and day out. Uh, my husband is the one who takes it on the chin for us. My dad is the one who gets up early and does what needs to be done. Uh, that vision the vision that Christ sets for us of giving everything is one that is both compelling and life-giving. And it's beautiful when you see these dynamics at work, when you see by the power of God, husbands and wives loving and respecting each other as God intended. And that's my hope for us as a church, not just for our marriages today, but, before, but for our young people that our little boys and girls might grow up in a church seeing what it means to be a man and a woman according to God's word. So that's the third characteristic of marriage. The fourth one is this. The fourth attribute I think we see here in terms of God's good design is that in marriage there is to be a relationship of cherished devotion, or you might say oneness. And so I think this is interesting because God doesn't just give us the parameters for marriage. That's kind of what we've got so far, right? One man and one woman for life, certain roles. But he also dictates the nature and the quality of the bond between the husband and wife themselves. Uh, we find this in verse 24 and 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, were not ashamed. This is the, the beauty of marriage. This is the enjoyable aspect of, of marriage because that, that one flesh is not just a physical union. Uh, the Hebrew word there uh, is one that speaks to the mingling of souls. So what God clearly intends is that, that the man and the woman wouldn't just do the thing that God has called them to, fulfill their roles, get the job done. What he really wants is for their relationship to be life-giving, to be a deep intimacy on every level of the person, intellectually, intellectually, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And this, this is a beautiful thing. This is a wonderful thing. Uh, this is, however, a tricky thing. Tricky because I think this is the one aspect of marriage that we might think that we've achieved it before we actually have achieved it. And, and here's what I mean by that. Oneness in marriage, a sense of intimacy in marriage, is actually something that we feel very early on, even before we're married, I would say. That, that's, that's why we get married, usually, is because we meet someone, and we don't want them just to be a friend. We want to be more than a friend. We like them. We like the way they look. We like the things they do. We like to be around them. There's a spark. There's chemistry. This is good. This is God's design. It's beautiful. It's wonderful, right, to fall in love, to, to, to know someone more and more, and to want to know them more and more. This is the whole thing about relationship. This is, this is why, young people, why you shouldn't start dating too early, because once you get on this train, it's only going in one direction, right? And that is towards greater and greater intimacy. That's the point. The, the whole point is that you would get to the point of saying, I, I want to be close to you in every way. I want to spend the rest of my life with you, and that's what marriage is, the consummation of a relationship, of intimacy, and it's a beautiful thing, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, the desire of two human beings who know and love each other is to be, verse 25, naked and unashamed. It's a glorious thing, it's a wonderful thing, it's the honeymoon, we all 
look forward to that if we're thinking of getting married. And afterwards, we think to ourselves, we've done it. We are one. This is great. I hope the honeymoon phase goes on forever, but regardless, we finally have the intimacy and we think it's fantastic and we assume that we are one in the fullest sense of the word because it sure feels like it, right? The romantic feelings, the connection, can't get enough of each other. But the truth of the matter is that we are not yet one if we've only been married for a week or whatever it is. All of those feelings, all of that progression is a great thing and a good thing, but true oneness doesn't doesn't come quickly and it doesn't come easily. Now, there are some marriages I've met, some people who are blessed by God, and they just say, you know what, Matt, I feel like we've been on the same page since day one. Praise God. It can happen. But the majority of the time, it is not that easy. The majority of the time, it takes work and time and sacrifice. And there's lots of reasons for that. There are lots of things in this world that, um, that tend to prevent or inhibit oneness. And these are things that are external and internal. The external things are, are the things of life. They're usually good things. And, and that's the, the, the challenge is that for married couples, you know, you feel so close and then you start to do life together and then things, you don't realize it start to get in the way. Work, which before was, I mean, it's work, but you could work till 8 p.m. at night if you needed to. Didn't, didn't hurt you, maybe your relationship with the Lord, but now all of a sudden there's someone that you, you, you aren't spending time with, and that, that can be a problem. Uh, there are friends, friends perhaps of the opposite sex that you, you know, had connections with, but if you are spending a lot of any time with them, I would say, and one-on-one, that, that can be a problem too. That can get in the way of, of the oneness with your spouse. There are families, families of origin, that at one time, especially if you were living at home before you got married, there was a real closeness there. And a lot of expectations there. And we should note that it's very clear a man should leave his father and mother. It should be a a separation. But if that doesn't happen, that can be a problem. Kids, of course, are always a problem for this kind of thing. And they get in the way. So there's lots of external things that, that can be tough. And then there's also the internal things. There's the ways in which we don't feel known in the way that we want it to feel known. Or don't feel understood or appreciated. And it means that you can have a couple that in week one, you know, just are head over heels, feel so very, very close, would be absolutely certain we are one, we are one together, one in Christ is fantastic, and yet 10 years later, feel so far apart. And, and if you were to ask them how that happened, they might not even quite know how that happened. Because it, it kind of creeps up on you. Don and I have had definitely seasons where, where we've realized there's a, there's a big gulf between us. I remember one time we went to a marriage conference and afterwards we're just like, I don't know what they were talking about, but that, that's not us right now. We don't, we don't feel that. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for that. External reasons, moving, young kids, new ministry, and internal reasons too. We had to work, work through that and it What it means for many married couples is that we are asking the question, uh, how can we, at this stage, this midway point stage, how can we pursue oneness when uh, I feel like we have been and it hasn't happened and we've been trying and it hasn't happened? What what hope is there that we could actually regain this sense of connection? And so uh, I would submit to you that what we see here is a bit of a blueprint for that. And those two words, I chose them on purpose. I think they do a good job of capturing the intention of God's design that there would be a cherished devotion between husband and wife. And by that I mean uh, a genuine understanding and loving and appreciating of the other person and a devotion to that person. And I want to get very practical. So uh, I have have an illustration, sort of a negative illustration that I think will help. Um, this comes from a book I read this summer on the history of Hawaii. It's a narrative, uh, you know, a fiction, historical fiction. Uh, it's going to take me a little bit of time to set it up, but I think it'll pay off, okay? So here's the setting. Uh, this is a, a story of the whole history of Hawaii, but I'm going to zero in on one part right after World War II. Uh, it centers on a Japanese family. Uh, there were many Japanese in Hawaii when Japan attacked. They, they would have considered themselves Japanese Americans. They were Japanese Americans. 
and then Japan attacked, and so there was a fight. It was very awkward. Uh, they fought, though, for America. They went to Germany, fought the Nazis, came back, and so when they were at the time where the bomb had been dropped, they're trying to rebuild Japan, they sent many of these Japanese-American young men to Japan as translators to help them, you know, rebuild into uh, the rebuilding effort. And uh, maybe not surprisingly, many of them met uh, women over there, Japanese women, who they quite liked. And they had a relationship, they were over there for a while, and they wanted to marry. So Goro is one of the characters. Young Japanese uh, American goes over there as a translator and meets Akemi. She's a beautiful uh, Japanese girl from Tokyo. They fall in love. They're not supposed to even date, military rules, but they do. Their love is so great, and they find a way to come back to Hawaii. Now, you would think that this would be a match made in heaven because Goro's family is totally Japanese, Japanese-American, but they speak all Japanese. You would think that this would be great, bringing home a Japanese bride. Everything's going to be fantastic. It's not fantastic. Very difficult. Why? Because there were actually a lot of differences between Goro and Akemi. Uh, one of the differences was that uh, Akemi was from Tokyo, from big city. Goro was from, you know, in Hawaii at the time, it was very uh, rural, Everyone was working in the fields, but it was very simple living. Uh, there were different interests. Akemi was used to uh, the symphony, was used to the, the museums, used to fine art, high art, literature. And she came to Hawaii, they didn't have any of that. And it was very frustrating for her. It was also frustrating because Goro didn't seem even interested. I mean, they did have a symphony, but when they went there, she badgered him to go. They finally went, but he thought, this is a waste of money. Why are we doing this? We have to spend on better things. They fought about it. They never went back. Another challenge was that they lived with Goro's family. And Goro's mother was not so pleased with Akemi because he, she thought she was stuck up. And so Goro would come home every day, and his mother would take him aside and say, your wife, and talk to him about his wife. She's being horrible. And then he'd get into the other room, and his wife would take him aside. Your mother's doing this. So Goro never wanted to go home because he would go home and just have the women in his life, and so he was more and more distant. There were a number of things externally and then internally that over the years, a couple of years, uh, meant that Goro and Akemi felt very, very far apart. And Akemi felt completely trapped, and so she decided, I, th I think I just need to go back to Japan. She started talking to her friends, I think I'm going to go back. So at this point in the story, there is a sociologist her name was Dr. Yamazaki. She was studying these, these couples. There was a bunch of them just studying for, you know, interest aid, academic aid, seeing what happens with them. And so she met with Akemi, just talked with her. And she was very concerned. She knew Goro's family. So after the meeting with Akemi, uh, she phoned Goro's brother, Shig. And uh, this is the conversation I want to show you. I think this is helpful. So she calls... Shig, and she says this, Shig, uh, it's none of my business, but your brother Goro is going to lose his wife. You think so? I know so. She used every catchphrase the girls use before they catch a boat back to Japan. What could he do, Shig asked. Buy her three Beethoven symphonies, Dr. Yamazaki said, knowing that to blunt Goro, such a step would be beyond the outer limits of imagination. So think about that for a minute. I think that last sentence is very insightful. H how could buying three Beethoven symphonies save a marriage? Think about that. She's, I think she's bang on here. If, if you know anything about people in marriage, you know she's bang on here. How, what, why, why would buying three Beethoven symphonies save a marriage? Not because of the symphonies, right? Beethoven's great, but it's not that. It's what it would mean to his wife, of course. And what would it mean? It would mean that finally, Goro is showing that he has actually listened to his wife, that he actually appreciates her, understands her, and understands the things that she loves. And not only that, he's taking some of his precious money that he's been saving and sacrificing it and buying, spending money on something that she loves. And all of that would do what? Would say to his wife, I know you, I hear you, I love you. I'm for you, which is the very thing she's been longing for all this time. It, it, it's not about the symphonies, of course. It's about the heart behind the symphonies, that, that he would demonstrate that, that he cherishes her, that he's devoted to her. But notice the problem. 
Why will this be impossible? It's impossible because to do this would be what? Beyond the outer limits of Goro's imagination. And this also, I think, is, is really helpful because this is the challenge of marriage. For him, it's like, I, what do you mean symphonies? What, do, you, do you know what we're trying to do? You're trying to build a life, just music. Sing if you want. We're not going to spend money on that. It seems totally useless, inconsequential. He cannot even imagine that someone would do this. And that's the problem. That's the point. It means that he can't imagine what his wife is actually like, who she is. And if he can't imagine that, then he can't cherish her, he can't know her, and he can't love her well. And so what he needs to do is to get beyond the limits of his imagination. I would submit to you that's what we all need to do in marriage, is to get beyond the limits of our understanding of what is good, right, normal, right? What, what do you, what's a good use of our money? What's a good use of our time? If you think about marriage, this is the challenge of life. This is the challenge of actually being united. It's that one of us wants to go hiking, and the other one thinks it's stupid, and you sort of argue about it, but not really argue. You just kind of passively talk about it. And then you do go hiking, but you go hiking and you're grumpy the whole time. And so you have an argument about hiking and you say, we're never doing that again. And what? You end up with this big gulf. And why? Because you thought it was more important to work on the car or whatever it is. But why really is it? Because, because neither one was in a place where they wanted to actually cherish the other person. Not cherish hiking, but cherish the person and the things that they love. And it's so tough for us to get beyond ourselves. You have to understand, in the Garden of Eden, this would have been effortless. They would have been filled with such the love of Christ, the love of God, that they would have naturally cherished each other. Adam would have held fast to his wife, should have. So how do we get there? How can we possibly be united in this way? Where can we look to get the kind of power that would enable this, this love, this desire to cherish and understand. We can't look inside ourselves. Frankly, you, you've probably tried. That's probably why we are having this, this difficulty. We know we don't have the capacity. We can't just look to romance, right? The romantic movies and books, it's, it's superficial. The, 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 the love in love feeling, great, that happens when you first meet someone. What about 10 years later? It's not helpful. We can't look to the wisdom of the world. Where do we need to look? We need to look to Christ, Jesus why? Because in him, we have both the pattern of genuine love. What did he do? He cherished us. He left the glories of heaven to come down into this world, this sin-filled world, to live amongst us. Why? Because he loves us. He's devoted to us fully. He's shown us. He didn't just talk about it. He did it, and he sacrificed his very life, went into the hell itself to save us. That is cherished devotion. It is the example we need and more importantly, the power that we need because his spirit, the spirit of Christ is the one that transforms our hearts from being self-focused to being soft and filled with God's love and, and able to actually know another person and to sacrifice to the point of, of convincing them, I truly love you. I'm for you. So how do we do this? I think you see the practicality of what I'm pointing to. I think it'd be really helpful for the married couples here to think to ourselves, what are the three symphonies I need to buy my husband or my wife? And you know what I mean. It's not buying something. What is the thing I need to do? Some of us might not even need to talk about this. Maybe we've been talking too much about this. We just need to do it. We just need to, to show our wives, in a consistent way. I, I really, I love you as you are. Not as I, not in the future thing that I hope God's going to do. You're not a project to work on. I just, the way you are, I love you. I love the way God made you. I want you to know I'm for you. And we devote ourselves to each other. And you need to know that uh, it's not too late. It's never too late when God is involved where the Spirit is at work, there can always be renewal and forgiveness and reconciliation. And, and my hope and my prayer is that that is what would happen in our marriages, 
that we would gain a vision of God's good design for our marriages and that we would see it work itself out. And I want to leave you with this verse. We hit it last week. We'll hit it again. Ephesians 5.31, connecting the Old Testament creation marriage account to today. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. May it be so to the glory of God. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the power and the example that you are as one who loved sacrificially, who led with gracious authority, who submitted to your Father. God, may you help us as a church to be the kind of place where marriages flourish, where husbands and wives step into their roles as you've called them to, where, we're, where we are blessed and helped. We pray that this would happen by the power of your Spirit and through the counsel of your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.